My name is Monk Rowe, off camera, and uh, for the Jazz Archive at Hamilton College, I'm very happy to have Gary Smolian here. And uh, I want to start out asking about all those stickers on your baritone sax case. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, to, uh, to people who aren't that familiar with the life of a musician, mm -hmm. it looks very exotic. Really? It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think it looks like, oh, you've been to all these places. That must be the greatest thing. Is I've it, been is to, it, well, you know, the thing is, uh, I, I think musicians hear that a lot. They say, oh, you're a musician. There must be great. That sounds like a real, you know, amazing life. You get to go to all these places. And, but, you know, in, in many, many, many cases, that's not really the reality. The reality, reality is you go to a lot of places, but you see very little of those places because you go from the airport to the hotel to the sound check to the concert and back to the hotel and to the airport the next day. Uh -huh. So, we, you know, unless in, in, on rare occasions where we're in a place for a week playing in a club or for a couple of days where we have a chance to actually, you know, take a walk and get out of the hotel and see something, a lot of times we're just on the plane and, you know, especially if you're on tour, you're playing a lot of one-nighters and you're just kind of, you know, hoofing it from place to place. So basically, I get a, if I get a backstage pass or a sticker, I just slap it on my case. Yeah. Um, that's, so that's, yeah. I mean, I just, I started doing that a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, I just, I just kind of continued. continued well, it looks good, that. you know. But, you know, the, the, but that is the reality of, of musicians on the road is that, a lot of times we go to these amazingly cool places, and um, it's it's all New Jersey. <laughs> it's all New Jersey. I like that. <laughs> it reminds me of that uh, often quoted Phil Wood story about the uh, part of the jazz education should be getting on a bus and yeah, driving around the campus. Yeah, and you know that's yeah. that's a lot of it. A lot of it right. is just uh, you know. The traveling is, I mean, I, I think we get paid to travel. Mm. You know, the playing part is incidental. I mean, you know, sometimes we'll you know, travel for hours and hours to get to a place and then play for two hours, yeah. and, or even, not even two hours, sometimes we'll play a 75-minute set and just get back on the plane and come home the next day. Wow. Well, I noticed something today that I, that I liked and I thought was interesting and that uh, I should tell our readers and <clears throat> viewers that I just saw you perform in Utica mm -hmm. with a with a typical sort of uh, assembled group, mm -hmm. you know, a quartet that had never performed together before. But you guys had a couple music stands, mm -hmm. which doesn't always happen. Um, was that your doing? Um, that Well, that I think what, 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 I don't, for me it's I like to get into a situation and not necessarily just kind of wing it and call tunes, but to bring some arrangements yeah. and try and do something that's, you know, present something with a little more formality and um, something that's less just thrown together yeah. haphazardly, even though I do enjoy that situation as well. Mm -hmm. um, just winging it and getting on the stage and kind of figuring out what you're going to play. We did have the luxury of a short rehearsal, and um, like I was telling folks who came out to the other side at the gig this afternoon is that uh, you know jazz is a language and it's like any other language and if you learn to speak the language you can play with almost anybody so you know the level of musicianship is high in this area I and mean, there's people who can really play um, the only thing I was missing unfortunately was a bass because mm -hmm. either through um, you know budgetary constraints or I don't know what the reason was you know Rick, the pianist was um, the bass player yeah. was playing bass as well as piano. Mm -hmm. uh, I just just in terms from a, you know a sound point of view, you don't really get the bottom end of the band that you would with a, if you had a bass player yeah. playing. There's for me something you know there's something really missing without the bass. It's interesting you say that because uh, I can tell that. The sound, in the general sense of the word, seems to be very important to you because when someone asks you about the biggest difference between playing alto and moving the baritone, it was all about the sound. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, to me, in music, general sound is first. Sound comes before anything. I mean, if you if you listen to all of the great 
musicians in this music, they all have individual sounds. They all, that's the first thing that you hear that grabs you, right? If you listen to the, the, just the, the tenor saxophone, right? You have John Coltrane, Johnny Griffin, Gene Ammons, Joe Lovano, Joshua Redman, Chris Potter, Don Bias, Frank West, and the list goes on and on. Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, Georgie Ald, they all play the tenor saxophone, but they all have Al Cohen, Zoot Sims, I can go on all day, Tina Brooks, Hank Mobley. You know, they play one note, you know who they are immediately. And to me, that's like the defining thing about being a musician. For me, the most important thing is your sound. And I've given a lot of thought and, pra and a lot of practice to try and really develop a sound that's personal and unique to me because that's the first thing that people hear. I mean, you can be a great technician, but if you don't have a good sound, no one's going to want to hear you. They're not going to be able to get past your sound. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really the identifying characteristic of who you, who you are as a musician. And your sound is not in the instrument. The sound is not, in my case, it's not in the saxophone, it's not in the reed, it's not in the mouthpiece, and it's not in the ligature. The sound is something that you carry within your very being. And that's what comes out. So take someone like Sonny Rollins, right? I, th I think that if you gave Sonny Rollins 50 different tenor saxophones, 50 different mouthpieces, 50 different reeds, and 50 different ligatures, he's going to sound like Sonny Rollins with some variation because maybe the instruments aren't comfortable behind, you know, maybe his comfort level behind the instrument isn't the same. But essentially what's going to come out is Sonny Rollins because his sound is not in the instrument. And I tell that to my students is that don't look for the magic instrument because there's no magic instrument. Right. Or the magic mouthpiece or the magic reed. It doesn't exist. Find what it is that's comfortable and then practice. And Something listen. that basically works and then you've got to put your... And then you have to put... You, you, you have to, it's up to the musician to breathe the life into the music and breathe his life, your, your, your breath and your life force into, into that instrument. How does... Jazz pedagogy mm -hmm. help or hinder that process? Well, you know, I think that there is not as much emphasis placed on that because I think musicians are more concerned with learning harmony and how to play changes and learning tunes. And, you know, I. I yeah, that's a tricky question. Um, I, but it's, it should be all part of the same thing. I mean, your sound, should, you know, developing a sound is, is, that should be number one in jazz pedagogy, as far as I'm concerned. The, partly the reason I asked that question is because a lot of the, a number of the really veteran guys who mm -hmm. I've spoken to sort of bemoan the fact that the younger players, as they describe them, mm -hmm. all sound the same. Mm -hmm that they have learned the scales and mm -hmm. the patterns and right. you can't recognize who they are. There's a very homogenous way of teaching music in jazz education in a lot of instances. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think it's really important to get musicians like that, only musicians involved in jazz education because their mental, their, their, the things that are important to them are different than in maybe the typical jazz education route of someone who goes to school gets a bachelor's, gets a master's, gets a PhD, and goes right to teaching without having had the benefit of even spending a lot of time on the bandstand. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, jazz is really an experiential music and you have to play with people who are better than you. You have to get your butt kicked on the bandstand. It's really, that's an important part of growth as a musician. But, you know, jazz education, I think, has kind of done a little flip-flop where, you know, people like Youssef Latif and Max Roach, they were hired at UMass... I don't know if, you know, they, I, I would, don't think Max Roach has a PhD in jazz education. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these days it's almost like you need to get an advanced degree to even be a considered for, a, for a, a jazz teaching position. Where I think, and that, I think that's been a change in the last couple, you know, last mm -hmm. couple of years. That's kind of been the direction that it's been going in. Um, and I think there has to be some kind of a balance between that and getting people who are actually on the scene and touring and playing. Mm -hmm and you know, getting them involved as well. Yeah. Is that your situation? I mean, you, you, you do a lot of educational work. I do a lot of education, but I don't have 
any full-time teaching position. Yeah. I, I, I'm presently uh, the adjunct professor of jazz saxophone at Amherst College. Right. And, you know, I have a handful of students every right. semester. But I, I, for me, I, really, I, I love jazz education. I, I love teaching and being in that world. Um, I had a lot of incredible mentors when I was a teenager growing up. I had, uh, growing up, when I was growing up on Long Island, um, there was a alto saxophone clarinet and flute player named Joe Dixon who was a, uh, he played with Bunny Berrigan and Artie Shaw and, uh, you know, he was very active in the swing era and he had um, a jazz ensemble of teenagers in Nassau County on Long Island called the Long Island Nassau County Youth Neophonic Jazz Orchestra and he became a really strong mentor and when I grew up there were some amazing saxophone players on Long Island like Billy Mitchell who was from Detroit mm -hmm. played with Thad Jones and uh, he, he was really a powerful force and I had a chance to play with him a lot and get my butt kicked from him as well. So that's, it's important for young musicians to have that experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and because of the demise of touring big bands, you know, the apprenticeship, apprenticeship system is, long, is, is kind of dis disappearing. Um, so young musicians coming out of college are forced to kind of really create their own situation and create their own scene. So, it's also interesting that in almost every junior high and high school in the country has a jazz band now, mm -hmm. a swing band. But not that many of these students actually listen to the music. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the music is not easy to find in a lot of cases. It's still very much an underground music in the sense that it's not prevalent on television, it's not easy to find on the radio, unless it's a, you know, a, a college station that has jazz programming. Mm -hmm. It's not mainstream in our society. It's, so unless you have a band teacher who really is into the music and brings in records and you know, exposes the students to the music, it just becomes an, just another ensemble for them yeah. to play that music without really even understanding you know, the language and how it's really meant to be played. Mm -hmm. So, but the fact that those ensembles exist is really a great sign. Yeah. And the fact that there is, you know, a, um, support from the administration and support from the community to keep those ensembles going, I think that's huge. Right. Because the kids need some kind of exposure. And, that, and the younger, the better. Before we leave this, uh, this sound question, mm -hmm. What are the actual, I mean, you had you said this great thing just a while ago about the, the mouthpieces and the reed, and you had actually answered my question before I asked it, but mm -hmm. what else actually goes into this, uh, mm -hmm. this sound question? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you say you can, you can identify any number of people from one phrase, mm -hmm. what makes that happen? Why does Ben Webster jump off the, the record as Ben Webster mm -hmm. and Coltrane. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think that at that in that during that time period, I think there was a real emphasis on kind of finding your own way and finding your own path and developing your own sound. You have to also realize that these musicians existed before there was you know jazz education was even an apple in somebody's eye. I mean, you know that they had the they had the opportunity to develop their musicianship, you know, on the bandstand, and they were out playing probably from a very young age. You know, even playing in local bands, and then, you know, been in Ben Webster's case, you know, joining Duke's band, and uh, so I think there was it was just I think it was kind of you, they were forced to do that, and they didn't have all the you know the books and the, you know records and play along records and all that. It's uh, I just think that the scene was different and I think that that was really kind of a, a valued characteristic in your playing was to find your own way, mm -hmm. you know, find your own sound. You know, you can, um, music has a very, the development of jazz is a very organic development from generation, from one generation to the next. And uh, within that generation, they've always, you know, musicians have had very personal and unique approaches and sounds. So I think I just I think it's what's valued. 
And I think we need to kind of go back to that kind of um, you know, the mentality of that and the, and, the, and the importance placed on that. It's like, you know what? Find your way. You, know, you have all of these books and all of these aids, but is it really helping you in the long run to kind of find who you are and discover who you are mm -hmm. as a musician? And for me, you know, it's also, it's, it's not just music that goes into creating the, the sound. It's like, it's how you live. What kind of books you read, what kind of movies you watch, what kind of people you hang out with. Um, I mean, that all has a big effect on how you're going to play. Well, so in some sense, it's, uh, it's almost comical to tell a 19-year-old kid, you got to find your own sound, man. I mean, they're mm -hmm. just, they're, they're not grown up yet. Mm -hmm. in one, in one I guess they can start on it. Yeah, but no one's, no one's going to find their own sound when they're 19 or 20. Yeah. It's very unusual yeah. uh, because, like you said, they're, they're incredibly young. But I think that they have to be encouraged to start that process at a young age. Mm -hmm. If they're going to really go on and consider playing this music for their life, right. for their work, for their, mm -hmm. you know, in it, for, as in, for their passion, because yeah. it has to be a passion. Um, it's not a job. But I, I do, I, what? Go on about that. Yeah, it's no. It's not a job. You can't, you know, I don't consider what I have, a, what I do as, a, as having a job. You know, it's, it's, being a musician is inherently wrapped up in who I am as a human being. And you, I, don't, I can't separate those two things between being a musician and being alive on this planet as a human being. Um, and, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of passion there. I feel like a lot of times, I really feel like if I couldn't play, that I would die. I just feel like I just, you know, I just, it's really so much a part of my existence in, um, in the world. And I, I try to instill that in young musicians. It's like, this has to be something that you absolutely have to do. And it's almost like if you have a choice, you should do something else. In a way. Uh -huh. Because it's... Um, it's not an easy life, being a musician. There's a lot of sacrifices involved. Yeah. I mean, and just, and, and just the amount of time that you have to practice, that's just a small one. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you know, if you start making it and becoming successful, there's, you're away from home. If you have a family, you don't see your kids grow up. You're, you know, there's, it's not, it's not the, um, it's not, it's not necessarily always an easy existence. Mm -hmm. And for instance, you're leaving, you said you're leaving for Japan on Tuesday. Yep. And how long will you be gone? About 10 days. Yeah. So you have to constantly juggle your on-the-road commitments with whatever you have at home, mm -hmm. including your employment at home, your teaching, but also your, your family life and that, yep. that whole end of things. Well, my teaching, the, the, at least my situation now, as long as I make I, you know, the number of lessons that I have to get in by the end of the, by the semester, I can, I, I, I can do that. Um, like I said, I'm not a full-time, I think full-time faculty, is, you know, people have full-time, who have full-time teaching positions, you know, the, the demands made on them are a lot more in terms of going to meetings, and, mm -hmm. and so I don't, I don't have those demands on me. I, I have the, you know, the freedom to come and go, which is kind of a nice balance for right. me. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I was away a lot. My, you know, I, I have a son who's 22 and a daughter who's 19. And I've missed a lot of things in their life, missed a lot of experiences. I mean, I remember many times going straight from the airport to my son's baseball game with my suitcase and my baritone, you know, trying to catch the tail end of his game. You know, and, and, and I think, uh, I think that was hard for him. I think it was hard for my kids to be away that much. Um, I mean, they told me, you know, my family's always supported me. They always understood that, that, you know, this is what daddy does or this is what my husband does. And uh, I see how, you know, it, he's, he's, he, you know, his very core of his existence is, is a musician. Um, and they've always been really great in terms of and supportive in terms of my coming and going, um, but I you know I think they're, I had I'm 
I'm sure, as a matter of fact, that it hasn't been always easy. Yeah. In fact, there was, uh, when we moved into our first house, my wife and I, we had, had effort, and uh, in, in Hastings on Hudson, New York, in Westchester County, we were living in, in another town and we bought a house, and the day we moved, I had to go on the road. So we moved the last box in the house, and then the car served, taxi came, and I went to the airport, and I left town, and um, and she unpacked all the boxes. Right? I can, I so can that hear was, that. Uh, so, and there was another time where uh, I have this, this, this had these kind of things happened a lot. Um, when we moved to our first apartment in Brooklyn, we moved our last box in, and the phone rang, and it was Count Basie's band. Wanted to know if I wanted to go on the road. And this is when Dan Jones was conducting. They called me to go on the road for eight weeks, and I didn't go. No, I, and I, I didn't go. No, I said no. We just moved in. I can't. You know, I, I couldn't do this. But I was, I'm, I'm a little regretful about that at this point because mm -hmm. it would have been the, probably the only time that I would have had a chance to, you know, to, to have that stand in front of him and yeah. to play with him with him conducting. That well, would have been. Something, but it just didn't feel right, you know. Mm -hmm. Just didn't. Uh... And so another time, where was, I was, uh, there was this, a band called the Philip Morris Super Band, mm -hmm. which was conducted by Gene Harris. This is we did three world tours, eighty nine, ninety, and ninety one, and that was an amazing band. It was you know Ray Brown, and Jeff Hamilton played the first year on drums, and James Moody and Herb Ellis, and Herbie Green and Johnny Coles and Sweets Edison, and Jerry Dodgen. I mean, it was really it was an amazing band. And we went on the road for three months. And 89, so my, my son was two. Yeah, he was two years old. And I came back three months later, and he cried when he, he didn't see, because he, he didn't know who I was. He thought I was, you know, he didn't recognize me. And I was like, wow. That's really like talk about a knife in the heart, you know. That was really that was a deep moment. So, you know, this like everything in life, it's a juggling act, and it's, it's trying to achieve some kind of balance mm -hmm. and trying to achieve some kind of you know serenity in your life, you know, between work and 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 uh, being home. Yeah. But I imagine that there are other jobs that require long hours. And I would imagine if you're like a high-powered attorney, or surgeon, or you know a businessman, where you're on the road. I mean, it's not just musicians who have to deal with this. It's like people in all kinds of professions. I mean, there I'm sure there are people who work 16, 17 hours a day, who don't see their families, and they never leave their. I mean, they just go to work and come home. And they still don't see their yeah. families. You know, so not, not, that, not that that's a justification, but it, it's a reality that you know one's work. Requires time, and sure. you know, I mean, if, if I hit the lottery, I could stay home a lot more. <laughs> if you hit the lottery, <laughs> if you did, yeah, what would be a dream project for you? Wow, a dream project. You know, that's I don't know. I don't think I have to win the lottery to do it to for a dream project. I, to be honest with you, well, I. I've been really incredibly blessed and, and really pleased with all the projects I've been able to do at this point. Um, you don't necessarily need a lot of money to make great music. Mm. You know, so I'm not sure. I mean, so I've done all my records in one day in six hours. So if you were to give me four or five days in the studio, I don't know what I would do. I like the pressure of being able yeah. to create a, a moment. If you mean a jazz record is a moment. I mean, think of all the great thousands of great records that have been done in those kind of situations. Yeah. Two four hour sessions. Or exactly. Something. And people standing around one mic and just yeah. playing. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, I just it, it seems like excessive amount of time to put a jazz record together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I for me it's like like I said, it's the, to do the to kind of put something together in six hours and you try to get a moment, you know, capture a moment in time. Yeah with warts on it, it's not going to be perfect. I mean, there's no perfect jazz record, no perfect jazz solo. I mean, you know, I mean, there are some more perfect than others, of course. Um, but when I did my record with strings, 
we did that record in four hours because there was uh, an issue with the studio, mm -hmm. with the, with the um, mixing board. So we lost two hours of time with uh, recording time. So we did that record in four hours and every tune, every take was first take and no listen backs. We didn't listen to anything. And so I, Bob Belden was, in, was he, wrote, he arranged the music and conducted, and it was really, I mean, he held it together, and he made that session happen. And it was really, it was, that was a pressure, pressure day. Um, but, you know, like I said, if you have great musicians, and you kind of, you kind of pull it together, you know, you can do these kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know, my, I, I'm very... Fortunate that you know I, I'm pretty happy with most of the recordings I've done and all of the musicians I've been able to to play with. Yeah. Um, this passion you have for music is there a precedent for it in your 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 parents or your grandparents or anything? Where'd it come from? My mom was a dancer, uh -huh. a ballet dancer. She had a dancing school, uh, a dance academy in on Long Island. Uh, my father's not. You know they're not musicians, um, and we wonder about that. I really don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. It was just I don't know. I guess it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, mean, I really don't know because it's there. I there. I don't. There haven't been any musicians in my family. Uh -huh. The closest thing I can come to is my mom's dancing. So, so there's some art, artistic oh, yeah. genes going on. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that we had my folks had a record player. There was music, you know, music in the house. Yeah. Um, but you know, in terms of jazz, yeah, really nothing. It was, yeah. and and to be honest with you, I'm not really sure I would have found jazz if I was, I mean, I, if I didn't hear Fats Waller when I was 13. That was an aha moment. I it guess. was. It was a really amazing moment for me. I was just flipping the radio dial. And heard Fats Waller playing African Ripples, which is a solo piano piece. And I had never heard anything like that. I was completely knocked out. It was like, what is this music? And who is this piano player? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, it was a real, that was a life-defining moment. It really wow. was. And it was a total accident. I was just listening to the radio, and I just happened to come upon this. And it was, uh, it was a... Uh, a jazz show called Just Jazz on WRVR that was um, hosted by an absolutely amazing disc jockey named Ed Beach, mm -hmm. who was uh, a real, I mean, he was, he was really responsible for a lot of my ed listening education in terms of when I was younger. He would, have, he would focus on one artist for five nights, every night. So wow. you, You'd hear five nights of Fats and Barrow, then the next night you'd hear five nights of Charlie Christian. I mean, the next week, not the next night. Then you'd do, you know, five nights of Johnny Griffin, five nights of Quentin Kelly. Then, then just, and the list went on and on and on. And I just, it was really something to hear this, to, to be exposed to this music in, in that way. So I was riveted to the radio. Um, so that was a, a big part of my kind of form, my, you know, formative years learning about this music. But I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure that any of it would happen if I didn't hear, hear that piece. Have you ever heard that story? Yeah, I told him. Did you? That's uh -huh. great. I did tell him. Yeah. And we actually corresponded. Neat. You know, so I have some letters from him, and he was, uh, he was a real teacher. I mean, he really was great. The radio. Um, that's not the first story I've heard. I've heard really nice variations on your story. Mm -hmm. People, including myself. That it came through the radio, you know, these ah, like wow, what is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I and I still love the radio. Mm -hmm. I listen, to, I listen to Phil Schapp every morning. <laughs> I mean, I've been listening to Bird Flight for I don't even know how many years. Wow. Probably thirty years. Yeah. I listen to him every morning, and uh, so you know, he and, and Phil Schapp and Ed Beach are kind of, you know, they're on the same kind of, same plane in terms of, uh, you know, the disc jockey as teacher. This jockey mm -hmm. is informing, not just playing the music, but you know, it's they're they they look at it upon their you know look upon what they do as teaching, you know. So it's it's yeah. it's very cool. 
you know, so the radio is, is really a, a powerful medium, you know, but you have to find it. It's not out there. You have to be, you have to find it. So you have to have some curiosity. And that's another thing that I try to instill in my students is that, you know, you have to be curious. You have to look for things. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I used to spend every Saturday at the record store. I would spend my whole day to save up my money and go to the record store. We had record stores back, you know, the LPs, you know, those flat discs that are made out of flat, you know, those are LPs. Anyway, I used to spend hours and, you know, trying, and then I would buy records. I would say, hey, wow, who's this saxophone player? I don't know who this is. And, you know, we had, and we were all, all the, everyone I grew up with, we were all curious about this music. So it, I try to instill that in my students is that you have to be curious, man. You have to be really, try and find it. And now with YouTube and all these online sources, I mean, there's the whole history of this music. You can see it. You know, you can see Coleman Hawkins play. You can see Lockjaw Davis play. You can see all these guys play. Benny Carter. I didn't have, we didn't have that growing up right. when I was a kid. So to be able to, oh man, that's like the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. To be able to just put on your computer and, and watch all these amazing musicians play. It's really special. Let me ask you about, um, I think was an important, you know, sort of milestone in your career with Woody Herman. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the phone call, who, who called you about being on that band? Yep. It was Bill Byrne, who was the trumpet. He was the band manager. Mm -hmm. And he called... Well, let me preface the story. I, I, I was playing on Long Island with a... It was called the Long Island Jazz Quintet at this time. This was 1978. And it was Glenn Drews, who was playing trumpet. It was Actually, he's the one who got called to play with Woody first. So Glenn Drews, the trumpet player, he, he left our group and... He was on Woody's band. And a couple of months later, the phone rang, and it was, you know, Bill Byrne, who was the road manager and the fifth trumpet player. Glenn Drews had recommended me to join the band. Um, so that was, that's how I kind of, that's how they kind of found out about me first. And, um, they asked me if I wanted to join, first of all, and I mean, that's, that was kind of why I was playing in the first place, to try and you know, get a gig like that, to go out and play. So they were on the road 50 weeks a year. They played all the time, and all kinds of really amazingly interesting places. One day you play an Elks Club for a dance, the next night you'd be at Carnegie Hall. The next day you play like a, you know, at a VFW somewhere, Next night you play in a high school auditorium in a gym. The next night you're playing Symphony Hall in Chicago. The next night you're playing at a jazz festival. The next night you're playing, you know, it's like, a, it was really an eye-opening experience in terms of what it's like to be a musician. Because you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to play for all kinds of people in all kinds of different places. And still play at that level. Woody Irwin was like, Wow, I can't even begin to to speak about what an influence he was. Just in terms of how you, how you have to be just well rounded, and how you have to act and behave as a musician on bands. And just it's, it was it was a really a really amazing lesson. Um, so that was just it. I got the call, and I had never played baritone. This is when this is when I switched to baritone. So I I went out and bought a baritone, a Yamaha baritone with a low A. And two weeks later, after I got the call, it was May 25th, 1978. I joined the band in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and took my horn out of the case. I was so nervous. Because, first of all, you know, Woody's... One of his, his, one of his biggest pet peeves was alto saxophone players who played baritone. I found this out later. He hated that. And that was described me to a T. I had never, this is the first time I was ever going to play the baritone in public. Oh my God. So I took the baritone out of the case, sat down next to Joe Lovano. He was in the chair next to me. 
And so, the, but that was it, man. Four brothers, boom, early autumn, here we go. And uh, it was a great band. Uh, it was, uh, Mark Johnson was playing bass, and he was at that time auditioning for the job at Bill Evans, which he got. Mm -hmm. John Riley was playing drums, who now is playing in Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, sitting in Mel Lewis's seat. Uh, Frank Tiberi, of course. Dave Lama, Ralph's brother, on piano. It was really an incredible band. And the other thing that struck me about Woody that was really, really inspiring was how forward-thinking he was. He didn't live in the past mm. at all. I mean, he was into all kinds of modern music. I mean, he had uh, commissioned Chick Corea to write a three-movement suite for the band that we actually played a lot. And um, he loved the music with Steely Dan. We did a Steely Dan mm. record called Asia. So he was not somebody who was, you know, just content to just play his, you know, big hits from the past. He really was, uh, he had one foot in the past and certainly one foot in the future. You yeah. know? So he was, a, he was, and what a talent scout. I mean, if you look at all the people who went through that band from the 40s all the way up you know, until he passed. I mean, it's a variable who's who of music. So just being able to to be on the bandstand with him was real. It was an honor and a privilege, and, and I still feel blessed mm -hmm. to have had that opportunity. Because I really, it's also that's when I became a baritone player for those <laughs> few years. You know, I really grew to love the baritone. Yeah. And he didn't fire me, um, so he must have seen some germ of something there, um, some potential. Yeah. Uh, and I just didn't play the alto anymore after that. Uh -huh. What would have got you fired? From the Woody Herman band, not you particularly, mm -hmm. but, but did he have? Yeah, he, if you didn't fit in with the way, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't fit in with, if you didn't like your sound, if you didn't fit in with, the, you know, this, what he was kind of hearing in the ensemble, he didn't fire a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, if, if he fired a couple, you know, I think it was really just based on does this musician kind of fit in with my concept of this band. And the way you, when you knew you were fired is if when you were playing, Woody looked at Bill Byrne and went like this, or went like this. That was your fired. And then Bill would yeah, break the news to you. Yep. Wow. And it was it. Um, so I was waiting for this for the first two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But uh, they had to give you a two-week notice or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they give you a But, I mean, that didn't happen too often. Okay. Do you remember what you made? What was your yeah, starting so $350 salary? $350 a week. Mm. This is 1978, and we had to pay our own rooms. I see. So it was $15 a night for a hotel. But we got around that by uh, um, something called ghosting, where, you know... Um, one guy would check in to the hotel, and four guys would stay in the room. So we would spend 15 divided by four, what, like, you know, three or four three bucks. bucks a piece <laughs> in the hotel. And what we would do, we would sneak, you know, so four guys would get off the bus, and then, you know, they'd drive the bus around in the back of the hotel, and 16 guys would get out, and we would, we would uh, get, get a room with two beds, and then we would flip a coin, to see who would sleep on the box spring. So we put the mattress on the floor, and then you flip a coin, and whoever lost had to sleep on the box spring. <laughs> see, this is what I'm talking about. Isn't romantic? Music is so romantic and exotic, isn't it? Great? So you know, I've slept on my share of box springs, believe me. That's really interesting. Yeah. I had heard other terms, but not that one in particular. That, yeah, I mean, we did it my, in the rock when I was in, in the rock and roll days. We similar stuff, but that's really great. And I, I chuckled today because um, I forget what the question was at the concert. And mm -hmm. you, you mentioned a tune. You were talking about playing gigs to, to uh, put food on the table. Sure. And you mentioned the tune uh, Cherry you? Pink and Apple Blossom White. And I played that song last <laughs> night. <laughs> you did? Sure. Oh, that's funny. Sure. You know, you do what, what's required. And well, you know, I think that colleges also, as part of jazz education, should teach these mus young musicians how to play a gig like that. 
I think that would be really valuable because you get out of school and it's like, you know, I mean, I, I, I used to do four or five, we, we call them club dates. Some people call them casuals. Yeah. I think it really depends on what part of the car, you know, country you come from. But, you know, it's a wedding or a bar mitzvah, basically. And, you know, sometimes I would do five of those on a weekend. Two on, you know, two on Friday, two on Saturday. No, one on Friday, two on Saturday, and two on Sunday. And that's hard because they're four-hour yeah. gigs. And if, if you play a cocktail hour, that's a five-hour gig. So that's, and plus you have to drive. So you have to drive from one gig to the other, set up, play, and, you know, most of the music is pretty horrendous. You know, this is when disco was around. So we play all these disco tunes. Yeah. But I was doing, <laughs> I mean, I was playing with Kenny Werner, Billy Drews. I mean, we used to have like a horn section with five horns and a full rhythm section and a bunch of singers. I mean, we had these big, full-blown productions that, you know, I would cost a lot of money, I guess, for the, you know, for the, for the families. But at least, you know, we were, we were all together playing music with our friends. Right. But, you know, it was, it was it's not so easy, just on your, on your mental state, to yeah. have to, to play, sure. to play Havana Gila five times on a weekend. Right. And that's just one horror. We used to play medleys of horrors, you know, like, <laughs> play a half hour horror medley. But you have to know the tunes. Spell horror. H O H O R A. No, not horror. Not horror. horror. Or not horror. No, horror. 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 It's a particular form of Jewish dance that you play at Jewish <laughs> weddings or bar mitzvahs. Anyway, so we used to play tons of these things. So, do you want to play? At least, at least, do you want to at least have the instrument in your mouth and you're playing, or do you want to work at a diner, flipping burgers, or being a waiter? You know, I, I think it would be a good idea to, to teach. I mean, I, I, you know, I haven't, granted, I haven't done a club date in many, many, many mm -hmm. years. So I don't even know if people still do them with now as DJs. So right. I, mean, I don't even know if people have live music at events right. anymore. The way the music business is going with, you know, Broadway and shows and, you know, it's, who knows? It could be the, the, that whole, you know, Scene where having a live band at a wedding or a bar could be finished. I, you know, yeah. I really don't. It's, know. I'm not it's definitely in that not world anymore. Yeah, but the the DJs get most of it, but there's still some out there. Mm -hmm. um, but that was really you know part of one's education as well because you learn you know you're forced to learn a lot of tunes yeah. and, and a lot of tunes and a lot of different styles. Yeah. So good ear training. It's good ear training, and it's just good character building. Mm -hmm. Just also just. You know, it's not all, you know, it's, it's not, you know, being a musician is not necessarily all about being creative all the time. It's also about the nuts and bolts of going to work. Well said. Let me run a few names by you, uh, in addition to uh, mm -hmm. Fat Squaller. Mm -hmm. uh, Cannonball Edward. Wow. <laughs> Wow, I mean, what can you say about Cannibal Laterally? Cannibal Laterally was, was huge. And I don't mean in the physical sense. I mean, huge part of my development growing up. I mean, when I was playing the alto saxophone, he, he and Charlie Parker and Phil Woods and Gene Quill, it's, they were, I mean, huge influences. I mean, wow, just Cannibal sound and his time and his phrasing and his articulation and, uh, and just... You know how funky he was. Yeah, just, it was wow. I just, what can one say about Cannonball Alley? It makes me think of. Uh, I mean, I thought of him because you're talking about sound and. Yeah. To me, his personality, like, just mm -hmm. came out through his instrument. Yeah. And it's a good example of what you were talking about. It's a, it's that's a actually perfect example of you know you play how you are, and you can't. You can't hide. I mean, you, know, you, you you can't be different than you play. You know, your playing is a is a direct reflection of you know your who you are as a person. And I tell my students, it says what comes in comes out. If nothing comes in, nothing's going to come out. So, like I was saying before, you know, the movies you watch, the books you read, you know, everything that comes in as a musician is going to come out how you play. It's important. I mean, Cannibal was a school teacher, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. he was constantly talking to kids and preaching. And, you know, so yeah. 
he played like that. Uh, here's some names I'll put, mm -hmm. I'll lump together, which probably I should. Yeah. But guys like um, Farrell Sanders, mm -hmm. and Patrick Gilmore, uh, John Gilmore. John Gilmore, thank Patrick, you. Uh, you Albert Eiler. Yeah. Did those people have any impact on you? I, I, I was listening to them when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, a childhood friend named Peter Schmidt, who his father was um, the French horn, original French horn player in the New York Brass Quintet. I went to high school with him. And his brother, Fred, was a big avant-garde jazz fan. And so I, when I would go over to his house to hang out and play and talk and just whatever hang out as kids do, his brother would have Sun Ra and Albert Eiler and Charles Tyler and all these, you know, complete free music going on. So I was exposed to that when I was younger. Um, I, w I wouldn't say it's the, it was very influential in my approach, but I definitely was exposed to it and I was open and I, I was interested in hearing hearing about that music. So I was listening to like Charlie Christian and Benny Goodman and then Albert Arla at the same time. And it's funny because I kind of started on the on opposite ends of the music, like from, you know, uh, swing music and listening to Louis Armstrong, Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, and then listening to Sun Ra and Albert Island, and I kind of moved in this way to, and wound up with Charlie Parker. So I came in kind of this way. But, you know, I definitely did hear a lot of that music growing up. Okay. Um, but I'm really, I'm, I'm coming more of a, from a, you know, bebop, bebop yeah. post-bop tradition. Mm -hmm. I like playing songs. I like playing on forms. I like complex chord changes. I like tunes mm -hmm. with hard chords. Uh, I'm really into harmony. Mm -hmm. I could tell that. I, I think when I heard you play, and I forget what song it was, but you did this really cool sequence that, and both of them ended on this really neat, I don't know if it was the flat nine or mm -hmm. something, but I could, I could tell you that you were, this was not an accident, mm -mm. that you were the way you play. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's de, it's deliberate. It's not planned, but but I've I've really I'm fascinated with harmony, and I spend a lot of time at the piano, mm -hmm. and I think all of the solo transcribing I did when I was younger has really been instrumental in helping me develop that kind of harmonic sense. I think it's important for musicians to have that. It's almost like they have to. Ex really know what they're doing. You know, jazz is a lot more than uh, just playing by ear or by feeling. You know, there's this, pro this, this, this misconception that, uh, oh man, I'm a jazz man, man, I play what I feel, man, you know, and that, I, 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 that, that's not what it is for me. Yeah. I mean, jazz is really, four things have to hook up, right? It's um, what you can think, what you can hear, what you can feel, and what you can execute on your horn. The thinking part is really important because unless you're really thinking about the music, you can't really manipulate the changes, right? If you want to put substitutions in, or you want to kind of, you know, play in a different key, or you want to just kind of, you know, use some harmonic devices, you know, to, to kind of accentuate your playing. That requires some thought. What percentage of uh, how to ask this you mean how you divide those up? Well, I was thinking about you know one of the really up tempo mm -hmm. tunes you were playing, and you know your your solo had a nice arc to it, mm -hmm. and sort of about three quarters to the end you got really quick. Mm -hmm. You were playing really quick, and I'm wondering um, how many of those notes are deliberate. They were all deliberate. I knew exactly what I was, what I wanted to play. I didn't plan anything out in advance, but at the moment, I knew I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Okay. What do you do if you make a mistake? Ooh, well, I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, what do you do? If, yeah. All right. Jazz is made by well, human beings. Okay. We're not. We're flawed. Right. Okay. So you know, fundamentally, so. Um, and like I said before, there's no perfect solo. Right. Right. So you make a mistake, you kind of just, just 
you go again. Yeah. Well, what yeah, constitutes a mistake for you? Well, yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, playing something that I didn't really want to play, mm -hmm. making a wrong choice, um, ending my, ending, not, not ending the way I wanted to end. I think, for me, the most important part of your solo is how you end. Because that's what people are going to remember. You could play a great solo, but if your ending is weak and you're, and you're not committed, not committal in terms of how you want to end, you kind of just peter out or and your, your ending, your, 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 your cadence is not strong. That kind of weakens what came before. It's, a, wow. it's for me. That's a good thought. So I wonder if part of that is knowing, th uh, thinking ahead, like, mm -hmm. should I do one more chorus or should I, should I end here? If you well, do yeah, that's that's it's hard. That's a that's a hard choice to you know you not you, it's a hard choice to make, mm -hmm. and there's I've, and there's been many instances where I should have stopped where I kept going, mm -hmm. and there's been other instances where I should have kept going and I stopped. You know, so yeah, this might be an obvious question, but how how do you play different if you have a really cooking rhythm section mm -hmm. and if you don't? Well, if you don't have a cooking rhythm section, I, you, I have to do all the work. And that's hard. And I've been in that situation where I just, you know, I just kind of feel like I'm, you know, dragging a, dragging a train with my teeth. You know, it's just, it's really hard work. And after, you know, a whole evening of doing that, that's, that's really, uh, that's tough. So, but playing with the cooking rhythm section, you just, it's effortless. Mm -hmm. Because you're all on the same page, yeah. you know. You just kind of play, and it's easy, and it's fun, and it's because it's it, it's less work. Uh, because everybody's working equally as hard, mm -hmm. the, you know, to achieve the same thing, um, to try to create this music. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's not easy. And you know, a lot of musicians have always done done that. You know, go on the road and just play with local rhythm sections. And, Sometimes you get some good ones, and sometimes you don't get some good mm -hmm. ones. But you still have to play. Uh, I mean, I did a tour. I, I went to Australia um, well, quite a number of years ago. And um, did a gig in this club, and the promoter put this rhythm section together. It was like a rock rhythm section. Electric bass player, drummer, piano, and piano player. They just didn't know any tunes, it was just, it was, that was really, really, really tough. How many blues can we play tonight? Well, that, that, I wish we could have played one. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even that, we couldn't even play that. The old one chord vamp? It was tough, it was, uh, that was a hard night, so. Uh -huh. And I remember reading, reading an, art, an interview with Sonny Stitt when I was younger, because, you know, he really didn't have the luxury of touring with his own band. He was, you know, he would just go from club to club to club and play. And you know, that was that was hard for him. Yeah. That probably contributed to some of the problems that these guys would mm -hmm. you know, this being in a in a club and then it's like a drag with a night after night different people. Yeah. Not a healthy uh, lifestyle. Yeah, there are a lot of distractions out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, because it's hard because it is you know, it's yeah. it's exhausting. Um, I know you have to get to another gig soon. Uh, mm -hmm. Any immediate future plans or long-term goals for you? I just want to keep practicing and getting deeper inside this music. Um, it's funny, and I'm 54 years old, and I feel really committed to getting out there more as a leader. I've always, I've been, you know, I've, up until this point, a side man in, 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 in many different bands, mm -hmm. and um, I really want to get out and start playing, you know, playing quartet and trio and getting out and, and, and getting more gigs uh, under my own name and starting to play, emerge as, as a leader on this instrument, because there aren't that many yeah. people who are really dedicated to just playing the baritone saxophone, and I think in a way, you get typecast as a big band player as a baritone player I think it's hard to break out of that mm -hmm. but I'm determined to try and give it give it my best shot um, but
but as much as I enjoy playing in, in big bands, um, I enjoy playing in small groups that much more. And so I'm trying to create more opportunities to do that I'm, at this point. Yeah. So I'm, that's something that I feel really strongly about. I mean, it, you know, if you really look at the history of the baritone, there's really been only one musician, that's Jerry Mulligan, who's been able to really make it as a leader. And a lot, a big part of that was his writing, right? Yeah. And a lot of, yeah, and it was also right place, right time. Yeah. It was also being a good salesman. Mm. Um, that's not to take away from his genius. Uh, he was certainly an, an incredible musician, and I can only aspire to be, you know, a tenth of the musician that he was. He was really, of course, very important. Um, but for me, I, th I, you know, I thought, always thought that Pepper Adams was a more interesting baritone player mm -hmm. as such. Um, at least he touched me in a more meaningful way in terms of what I was trying to do on the instrument. And uh, he never really emerged as a leader in terms of being able to tour with his own band. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I really... I'm really striving towards at this point is to try and achieve some kind of you know um, direction where I emerge as as a le as a leader on this instrument. Because I read that there hasn't been one in, in some time. Yeah, yeah a long yeah, time. Long time. I, I read a small thing about you were you enjoy playing with just drums and bass. I do. I love playing with just I, that's my chosen mm. environment. Um, I had the great pleasure in, uh, of recording with Christian McBride and Billy Drummond, and we did a, a trio record called Hidden Treasures. And uh, the freedom in that, you know, without a piano or without a guitar, is uh, for me just magic. Uh, because I just feel free to kind of go and take the music in any direction, fewer, you know, I kind of go where I want without being kind of locked in yeah. with chords. And that's hard work too because there's no, you know, you, it's hard to stop. It's like kind of, you know, you have to play all night. Yeah. But that's okay, I really like that. Yeah. So, that, ideally that's, that's, you know, the group that I would like to kind of go out and play with. Mm -hmm. um, but it's challenging for the audience. I think it's hard to get club owners to book that because, first of all, you know, they, to get a, a baritone saxophone player booked at all, it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to get past that. And then without a piano, that's kind of tricky. So, you're, yeah, I, I suppose you're asking quite a bit from your audience. It's demanding. It's demanding. Too. It is. But I try to play, you know, I play, you know, play tunes or mm -hmm. tunes based on standards. Yeah. You know, so I try to not make it too alienating and try and bring them in in terms of, you know, playing tunes that, uh, you know, or playing material that kind of brings them in. Yeah. Um, so. Because, right. you know, the bottom line at the end of the day is that people are coming to hear us play and we're trying to, you know, play something that makes them feel good. Right? Yeah. And to reach them in some way. So, even though you're playing with just bass and drums, I think you can still do that. Well, you've had quite a few awards uh, over your years. Have been part of things that got awards. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, things are starting to happen for me. I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Well, I'm so. glad to hear it, and I enjoyed hearing you. And uh, thank you. On that note, we'll wrap up and <laughs> thank get you. you to your next gig. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.